from a Boston's immediate past president. And on behalf of the board of directors and the committee chairs and volunteers who've orchestrated today's thought leaders, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. We are really excited about this program uh, and are continue to be impressed by our, our thought leaders uh, and the work that they are putting in. Uh, we are so grateful to MovePlan for underwriting this session. Uh, today, we are joined by Chris Colon, as, as Janessa just mentioned, from MovePlan. Chris, if not to put you on the spot, but, but if you could uh, maybe take a minute, introduce yourself and MovePlan to the group. Chris, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> Is he there? Oh, sure he's here. No, we can hold that thought. We can let them do that <laughs> at some point during the during the morning. They uh, are a longtime corporate partner of the chapter and uh, have been involved in thought leaders for a while. So, again, thank you to those guys. Um, for those who are regular thought leader attendees, welcome back. Uh, for those who might be joining us for the first time, thanks for joining us. How this works is that we typically have a discussion topic as well as a moderator or speaker. Today, that's Joe Allen, Associate Professor of Exposure Assessment Science at the Harvard T.H. Chan, Chan School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us, Joe, uh, and he will also be joined by John Boucher, also of the Public uh, School of Health, Public Health, and as well as our think tank moderator. Uh, before we get started, though, one of the other things that we like to do in this session is uh, get information from you guys as well as allow you opp opportunities to interact with your peers. So we'd like to jump out into some breakout rooms just to kind of break the ice and get things started here, wake us all up a little bit, give you a chance to interact on a smaller scale as well as uh, in give us the chance to gain some, some good information for future topics. Um, before we jump out, and I think Janessa is going to shoot us off into, into different rooms and then pull us back, but if we could just as a, as a precursor, what we'll be looking to do is, is give your name, your company, uh, your role, as well as one thing that you as a facility manager would love to have more information about. And that's a little bit selfish on our part, but allows us to be able to uh, plan future programming or content, whether it's a white paper, a program, a podcast, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, name, company, role, and one thing from an FM perspective you'd love more information about. And then, um, thank you, um, Chris, Cologne is back. Chris, do you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? And um, also when you go into the breakout, if one person could be your scribe, and then when you come back, put into the chat everyone's burning desire for more information, I'll save the chat and then we bring that over to Think Tank for programming. <laughs> so Chris, would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself and move plan? Yes, thank you everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Colon. I am with MovePlan Group. Um, so we are actually a global move management and change management organization. Um, so whether it's workplace strategy, moving to a new building, um, new ways of working, or over the past you know nine months, uh, working through helping clients plan their return to office, um, that's what we do and what we love. And we're very happy to uh, sponsor IFMA and also sponsor um, this group in particular. <coughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, Joy, you can unsave or unshare your screen. We're going to go into, um, we're going to go into 10 breakouts. So you'll have three to four people. We're going to have 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes to, again, introduce yourself, name, company, role, and then just discuss each of you who's a one burning desire for more information that you would like from our from the chapter. And again, these can happen in programs like today, um, podcast topics and white papers. So all you have to do is accept the room and I'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Welcome back everybody. So hopefully you had um, a fruitful time in the in your breakout sessions. And if you all, either you could all each put in your own or if you um, did a scribe, if you could just start throwing everything into chat so I can save that. And that is absolutely invaluable for our Think Tank committee. Um, anyone on Think Tank, please wave your hands. These are our Think Tank folks. Um, they are the ones that will be taking all of your information and coming up with programming. 
So I'm going to turn it over to um, Joe and John to do their thing. All right. Um, well, I'm John Boucher, um, Associate Director of Engineering Construction, at Harvard School of Public Health. And I really don't have any great information to share with you. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to let the expert, Joe Allen, take over and uh, hopefully he can uh, get us all talking and, and be better aware of how to run our buildings in a healthy, responsible way. Thanks, Joe. All right, thanks, John, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come present today. So I'm going to, um, I think, go pretty quick. I had planned a time for about 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe I'll try and do it in tens because I'd really just want to have a discussion and hear what you're thinking about. So for background, uh, professor at School of Public Health at Harvard and um, work with John and colleagues on our own campus um, uh, COVID safety plan <coughs> across Harvard University. Uh, my background is exposure and risk science. I direct the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard. Uh, certified industrial hygienist. That's the field that anticipates, recognizes, assesses, and controls hazards in the workplace. Maybe you've worked with, you probably worked with many CIHs, I, I would suspect, on radiological hazards, chemical hazards, biological or physical hazards uh, in the office, schools, hospitals, you name it. Um, outside of Harvard, I'm uh, a commissioner of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. I chair their task force on safe work, safe schools, and safe travel. And I've been doing this kind of um, sick building forensics um, for over a decade now. And this is why um, the pandemic, while unfamiliar to all of us, actually has elements that are really quite familiar. I've been pretty vocal about risk reduction strategies in buildings and how to leverage our buildings uh, to keep us safe. And this is uh, one of the early op-eds I wrote in the New York Times, just bringing to attention uh, the role that buildings play in spreading disease from Mar uh, uh, SARS-1, MERS, uh, influenza, going back to measles. Um, and this was in March. And at this point, I had another one yesterday in The Guardian. This is the, I think, 26 or maybe 27 op-eds since last February, really trying to hammer home uh, or translate the science into actions people can take in their cars. What, what does it mean for airplanes? How about elevators? A common question we get all the time. Bathrooms. Uh, offices, school, a lot of work on schools. But one of the things I want to talk about with this group, which is in particularly important because it establishes that the building plays a key role or why buildings play a key role and how we've known this since February, despite um, pushback from WHO and CDC is that airborne transmission is happening, right? So three modes of transmission, close contact or large droplet, fomite transmission I'll talk about at the end an airborne transmission. Airborne transmission is driving this pandemic and it was ignored for about 10 months. Uh, just shocking to myself and everyone else in my field who study this because it leads, first you have to accept that airborne transmission is happening to realize that there's a set of controls that needed to be in place in addition to hand washing, distancing, uh, mask wearing, and that is specifically the building. All right, so I want to present you with some of the evidence uh, for airborne transmission. I won't go into the, the full story here, but first we can start with aerosol physics. When people talk, breathe, sing, cough, say ah, they emit a range of particles of different sizes, some that are quite large, over 100 microns, some that are you know sub-micron, but most, most are in the one to 10 micron range. And that's important because these are the uh, size particles that we inhale, uh, that get into our respiratory system in the upper respiratory and importantly, the lower respiratory tract. And maybe counterintuitively, these particles that are in that size range actually have more virus in them than the very large particles. So um, here's the thing that was missed early on. And I think uh, the medical community and others are starting to wrap their head around is that um, when you have particles in this kind of small, um, size range, you look at the x-axis there, it'll talk about a five micron particle. Uh, it doesn't settle out of the air quickly, right? So a five micron particle, if you look at basic aerosol physics, will stay aloft for 30 minutes. Smaller particles, one micron will stay aloft for hours. In fact, they'll stay aloft until it's removed or settles out of the air eventually, or removed through dilution, ventilation, or uh, air or filtration um, through mechanical filtration, or actually, um, 
through deposition in the lungs, which of course is what we're trying to avoid, but actually you have to account for that if you're doing modeling. All right, the other one that has been missed, uh, quite shocking that myself and other colleagues is that a five micron particle does not settle out of the air within six feet. This is, uh, was embedded in medical textbooks erroneously for decades and is the basis largely for where the early guidance on standing back six feet uh, will protect you. So these particles, look at the x-axis there. Uh, the, these particles of this size will travel across any room. And so whether or not they build up as a function of the emission rate, but also ventilation and filtration. So early on, this was uh, refuted. We, I wrote many uh, op-eds, uh, editorials and journals, had, was rebuffed by medical journals saying this was not a thing back in March and April. Um, but we had data after that, you know, air sampling data, detecting RNA in hospitals in places that could only be reached through the air. This is a study showing a viable virus detected at 16 feet beyond a patient and in a place with six air changes per hour and 14 filters. So we know that through air sampling data, the virus is detected beyond six feet. That agrees with the aerosol physics. Uh, and then of course we have high profile case studies. This is the early one in Guangzhou, China restaurant. The infector is in purple there, infected several other people around these tables. The cause, well, the cause was the infector, but the um, contributing factor was the uh, ventilation system, which was not a ventilation system, it was an air conditioning system with the recirculated mode only, no filtration. Uh, and people infected who were not at the infector's table beyond six feet. Uh, we've seen this in hospitals. This is the famous choir practice I'm showing on almost a 90% attack rate. In fact, this is one of the early studies. I forget when this was published or first reported. It was early in the, in the spring. And this was telltale that airborne transmission was happening. You can't have a 90% attack rate through fomite transmission or even close contact transmission. If one person's infected, even in a singing scenario, and it was all close contact transmission, which is what CDC had been saying, maybe the people around them are infected, not 90%. Uh, and the other thing that tipped me off here, the, the choir practice was in the evening. And as we know, buildings, uh, many buildings turn off or shut down or lower their ventilation rates. Uh, subsequent study determined that was true. So we have many case studies at this point. In fact, if you look at any, all of the case studies, it doesn't matter, you know, pick your favorite one, uh, ice skating, choir practice, restaurant, spin class, schools, camps, Anytime there's an outbreak, it's less interesting to me about the, the place and more interesting about the underlying factors. And they're all the same. Time indoors, number one risk factor, no mass and low to no ventilation rate every single time. Even this latest uh, airplane outbreak, maybe you saw that long haul flight to um, New Zealand. And it seemed like, well, maybe there was transmission on the airplane. But if you read the study, the airplane actually landed uh, for refueling at which time they turned off the ventilation system. So it's every, it's every single time we know that uh, the vast, vast majority of risk or cases and super spreading certainly happens indoors. Uh, my own team's modeling on the cruise ship. We demonstrate empirically through modeling that long range aer aerosol transmission accounted for a major portion, actually aerosols accounted for over 80, almost over 75% of the transmission. Uh, and, you know, just some of the history here it took, this is in August, I interviewed Dr. Fauci, still reluctance by CDC and WHO asking, why are we not acknowledging airborne transmission? This is August. This is, what, eight months, seven months into the pandemic. And he says he bring it to his task force, comes back to Harvard Medical School a couple of weeks later and acknowledges, yeah. Uh, he actually says, we've been underestimating aerosol transmission, transmission via particles that remain in air over time and space. Uh, then what happened, CDC updated their guidance and then weirdly removed it after three days on, uh, on airborne transmission. Uh, me and others wrote op-eds urging CDC to finally acknowledge this. This is in September, October. Um, and finally, finally, CDC puts up an acknowledgement in, let's say, late October, early November that uh, airborne transmission is happening and, and they actually put up a page on ventilation rates, largely pulling from our guidance and ASHRAE's guidance. Uh, and of course, we've known this for a long time. Uh, this is Florence Nightingale 160 years ago uh, saying cleanliness, fresh air from an open window is the only defense a true nurse either asks or needs. It's not shocking to anyone who's been in this space and knows the history of ventilation rate standards and how these are minimum standards. And so uh, we need to go above and beyond um, these approaches. 
Last couple of things I want to say before I talk, this is how we've been prioritizing um, uh, ventilation uh, targets is uh, first, increase outdoor air ventilation rates, two, increase filter efficiency. I'm sure all of you have seen this at this point, oh, not this, but this guidance, uh, MERV 13 or higher. And then supplementing with portable air cleaners, particularly for small volume rooms. We think this is a great plug and play, low cost strategy uh, for places that don't have the time or resources to put in the necessary fix to their system. This is really quite important for places like schools. Um, last, want to be sure I place the ventilation engineering controls in the context of holistic risk reduction. This is the uh, hierarchy of controls. We, re we modified it for this article in Harvard Business Review to talk about the five parts of the hierarchy of controls, eliminating exposure, prioritizing work from home, substituting activities, uh, engineering controls right in the middle, these healthy building strategies, paired with administrative controls, de-densification, managing elevators, and PPE, universal mask wearing is a must. And this is important because no one strategy in and of itself is sufficient to control risk. But if you layer enough of these on top of each other, uh, we can keep people safe. We've, we've seen what hospitals, for example, have done in terms of reducing risk using frameworks um, like this. Uh, the very last thing I'll mention just to spur some conversation uh, is around uh, masking and cleaning. So uh, I've written several articles on the benefits of masking going back to last April, but recently, actually yesterday was an article on masking, believe it or not, well, not believe it or not, there's still reluctance in some places to wear a mask. The science on masks is really quite clear, and I want to just uh, talk about that as it, or give a, a way to talk about it. Uh, it's the universal masking that's key, even imperfect masks. You have two 70% efficient masks. The fact that aerosols have to go through two masks gives a combined efficiency of over 90%. So universal masking gets you to 90%. Uh, reduction in exposure, and then you add on these other engineering controls to handle the space in between the mass. Uh, and last, wrote an article that might be of interest to the group a couple of weeks ago with some colleagues, um, pointing out that we don't have a single documented case of fomite transmission, uh, and many organizations are spending a fortune, time, resources, and attention focused on, um, you know, this uh, this this pathway that is not causing the spread. It can happen, um, but it's really minor compared to these other uh, exposure pathways. All right, I flew through that pretty quickly. Um, uh, and oh, I forgot, I have one very last thing I wanted to say, be sure we're thinking about beyond COVID. And as a resource, my team put together a report called the Nine Foundations of a Healthy Building to think about all the other factors that drive human health, well-being, and performance as we move from this year, hopefully, a disease avoidance strategy into more holistic health and well-being strategy. You know, health is not just disease avoidance, it's thriving, flourishing, and well-being. And so buildings play a key role in that too. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and John, maybe we'll have a, just a conversation or uh, see where you all wanna take um, this. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, does anyone have any question to lead off with? Hey, John, how are you? It's, it's Andrew Delpreet at Liberty Mutual. Um, yeah. Thanks again for the uh, great, great content. I really appreciate it. And I guess one question I would just like to, I guess, get your opinion on just because with some of the pulse surveys, uh, when we do return to work, the biggest, um, I would say, I don't want to say pain point, but biggest concern employees have is the ride up uh, on the elevator. And uh, whether they're effective or not, I know we have nanoseptic from the optics on the, on the push buttons. But um, I guess, is there any recommendations, whether it's the exhaust fans to the elevators or um, the ionization, I know is something that people have been talking about, or is it if everyone's wearing face coverings and it's a short uh, 20 second trip up, maybe the exposure is not as high, but just any, I guess, any feedback or thoughts around elevator rides? Yeah, so it's a great question. I'm going to share a resource for you. Um, you can see my screen there, this elevator etiquette article. Yeah. I can't see anybody right now. So hopefully you can see that just as a... You can. Yeah. Okay, no, it's, great. Great. it's an article in USA Today. I wrote maybe yeah, early June if you want to look at it. But um, it's really that simple. It, it's I think uh, despite it being a concern, so it's a valid and legitimate concern and, and something you're going to have to communicate, from an, uh, the reality is the, the time in the elevator is really quite low risk. Uh, 
-hmm. And for a couple of things, right? If you think about exposure, it's a function of three things. It's intensity of exposure, frequency, and duration. So an elevator duration, short, minute, two minutes, maybe less. Frequency, twice a day, maybe four times a day, go for lunch, maybe a couple of times more, very infrequent. Uh, so you're managing intensity of exposure. Well, we, so actually the ventilation rates without anything special in your elevator are typically going to be okay. But more importantly, uh, if you control the emission rate from people, that's key. So in our elevator etiquette rules, we suggest posting them in the elevator and outside. Masks on, of course, no talking. If you do masks on and no talking, you've significantly reduced the generation rate of aerosols, and if someone's infectious, that'll be low enough and the duration is short enough and the ventilation is good enough that um, we don't see elevators as a, I don't see elevators as, as something that's a concern. Now, the key here is communicating that because it's an obvious place that people are worried about. Some of the guidance that's been problematic from CDC on elevators is their six foot distancing, which for many elevators has caused them to be single ride uh, single rides, one person per elevator. That's a massive mistake in my opinion, because it's creating an unintentional uh, risk. And that is the queuing and backup on floors coming down in the lobby going up. And so what you wanna do is get manage this flow and queues. You want people in, up and out in the building back spreading out. Um, so it's communicating that. And I think these elevator etiquette, we have nine steps for elevator etiquette, but I think the big ones are just no talking, face forward, mask on, and it's really that simple. Awesome, nice, not great feedback, thank you. Sure, good question. Joe, um, you, you talked about some supplemental ventilation in, in smaller confined spaces. Could you talk a little bit more about that and, and what you would recommend in the types of rooms that we're talking about? Yeah, so, you know, a really easy strategy uh, and, and supported by decades of evidence is the use of a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter. Right? You don't need any bells and whistles. And we built a tool for schools you could use, but you know, it's a super simple calculation, right? The, the clean air delivery rate for a portable air cleaner is in unit is in reported in CFM. So CFM times 60 divided by the volume of the space gives you air changes. And so it's really easy, simple tool to say, hey, I have an office, interior office, maybe the airflow isn't that good. You have someone who's really quite concerned for some reason, higher risk, whatever it is. Um, and maybe your system can't handle the extra airflow, whatever it is. It's such a simple plug and play solution. You plug it in a couple hundred dollars, you can get four, five, six air changes per hour from a plug and play device. It also has the benefit from the psychological perspective um, that it's visible. So whatever enhancements you've made to your ventilation system, MERV 13 filters, that's all hidden from view. And so the only way people coming back to the office or building are gonna know it is, again, you're gonna have to communicate that you know, they're going to expect to see cleaning, even though that's, you know, it's important to clean and disinfect, but it's, we're over cleaning. Um, but they're going to expect to see that. And so the ventilation improvements, they don't see, but if you have these smaller rooms um, where you're having better challenge from a ventilation standpoint, from mechanical ventilation, or even natural ventilation, you're not sure you're going to get the airflow. Um, it, it's a really simple solution. We've been really pushing these for schools because they are really neglected in terms of their mechanical systems. And, and some of these fixes are years long, multi-million dollar fixes. And you know the cost of kids out of school is just so staggeringly high that we really have been promoting you know, a $200, $300 per classroom fix um, can, can stop, can fix, can cover that gap really, really quickly. Yeah. So just, I would, the last thing I'd say on air cleaners is look for high clean air delivery rate. If you're interested, my Harvard Healthy Buildings program is at forhealth.org, F-O-R health. And we have the schools.forhealth.org has a, a link to a simple Google sheet, Excel sheet that you can plug and play your clean air delivery rates and kind of see the air changes per hour. We've tried to totally simplify it. Um, so that, that's a resource. And if you want the more technical, we have a white paper there on, on the science around portable air cleaners, why they work, how they work, and, and some of the formulas if you're technical and want to get into that. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, another question? Come on. I nope. have I have a quick um, when you were just delivering your last answer, you were um, you mentioned that we're over cleaning. What is your thought on there was so much? I know when we first started these discussions, there was so much on surface 
you know, surface contamination, we can't touch things, we can't, you know, what is, we're talking about aerosols and what is your thoughts on cleaning protocols in this new era? Yeah, so first, I, I don't think anyone should beat themselves up over, um, uh, you know, the actions we took early on. There were a lot of unknowns. Um, we thought all three modes of transmission were happening. We didn't quite know which was dominant. I took the position early on too. In February 9th, first piece I wrote, said, look, we don't quite know, but we know from past things, it's probably all three. And what's, you know, while scientists trying to figure out the relative difference, let's just attack them all. Makes sense, right? Um, but we've learned a lot, right? It's been, now it's the most studied topic maybe ever in medical history. And, and so we know uh, a lot about how this is transmitted or not. And, and surface transmission is really low. So that said, I want to clear, fomite transmission can happen, but the easiest way to break the chain is encouraging hand washing and use of hand sanitizer. Because realistically, a cleaning disinfection protocol that's going to be, you know, as good as that would have to be cleaning every surface immediately after it's touched. Second, if someone is infectious and fomite transmission does happen, you know, it'd have to take a high viral load on a surface, let's say a doorknob, and then the next person would have to come almost immediately, touch it, transfer it quickly. It's about a log reduction each transfer. Um, and it's unlikely that the next person to come, there'd be enough virus left on the surface to infect them. So it's not gonna lead to super spreading, even if it does lead to a case here or there. And so um, the focus on, on surface cleaning, you know, I don't think we should be, be dousing our uh, indoor spaces with so many disinfectants all the time. Um, you know, I, um, the, the attention and resources should be spent on controlling airborne transmission, the things we've been talking about. Um, I absolutely, uh, well, any use of, a, um, uh, of spraying disinfectants into the air, uh, is not called for, right? You don't need to do it. You shouldn't do it. Uh, and if you are doing it, the, the, the person doing the application needs a higher level of PPE, absolutely. Um, so anyway, that, you know, I, I just, I, I've seen a lot of these protocols. I, I, I don't think it makes sense to do, you know, um, you know, closing a building for deep cleaning after somebody's sick or closing a school for a day of deep cleaning. That just doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. Doesn't, doesn't agree with the science is really the, the way to say it. Joe, we, one thing that's been mentioned quite a bit, and, and I don't know everybody's level of expertise, but the MERV filtration, right? Um, could, could maybe you explain it a little so, so in case folks don't understand, you know, what are the different levels and, and how do they help combat, combat this? Yeah, right. So first, maybe talk about filtration just broadly and maybe clear up two common myths. Um, perceptions or misconceptions about filtration. So sometimes I see that, you know, people say, well, you know, my filter uh, captures particles down to 0.3 microns. The reality is that filters are rated at their worst performing particle size, which is 0.3 microns. So filters actually perform better at smaller than 0.3 microns and bigger. So if you see HEPA 99.97 uh, capture efficiency, that's its worst performance at 0.3 microns. So HEPA is darn near 100%, if not 100% at one, you know, at the one to 10 micron range. So that's a common misperception. You see, I see it all the time, even from companies who make these products. We filter down to 0.3. It's like, not really, you filter down to 0.3 at some level and then even better below it. The other misconception, mis what's the right word there? Anyway, uh, is that, you know, people say, well, the virus is really small and because the filter only captures down to 0.3 microns, the virus is 0.1 microns, it doesn't capture the virus. So first that's wrong because it's a misunderstanding about what filters can do. And two, the virus is never naked in air, right? The virus is always encapsulated in respiratory aerosols, which are a whole range of sizes. So we don't really care about the 0.1 micron size of the virus. Most of the virus is in respiratory aerosols at one to 10 microns. And so filters do a really good job there. The problem with uh, typical uh, filters in a, in a building is that most common are MERV-8 filters, which capture about 20% of the particles in the size range we're most interested in. MERV-13 gets you to about 80%, probably greater than that, but we use 80% to feel, you know, put a little margin of safety or comfort in there. Um, so that's really the recommendation. The idea is this, right? You're, you're, 
the big picture is you're trying to, you have two mechanisms to remove these, dilute ventilation or filtration. So some of this can be outdoor air ventilation, great. Two, any recirculated air, if it's not going through a high efficiency filter in a space can lead to concentration of buildup of these aerosols. And so by having a MERV-13 filter, you're removing that and, and the, the, the air coming through the system that goes through a higher efficiency filter can be counted towards clean air delivery. In the sense that it's not, it's not clean air how we typically think about it in facilities. But in this case, we're thinking like, um, you know, virus free clean air, not quite free, but you know, we're talking about virus here only. Of course, if you bring in a lot of outdoor air, you could have outdoor air pollutants. It's not clean, but it's clean from a virus standpoint, COVID standpoint. So, right, you have outdoor air coming in, whatever is recirculated goes through MERV 13 or greater filters. So you get about 80% of that as clean air. Whatever you can't do, you can supplement with plug and play. Some small units that can do a small room, they're industrial size units that'll give you 500 CFM uh, through a HEPA filter. And so most buildings can't handle HEPA. Most building mechanical systems can't handle HEPA because of the pressure drop. Uh, mo many can handle MERV-13. Um, and um, you know, like at Harvard, I think we've gone over, right, John, you know, MERV-14. 15. 15. 15, right. And so, um, you know, I'd say go as high as you can. And we're talking about here on the recirculated air side. And it matter, of course, the, the nuance matters on the system, you know, where the air is being recirculated. So some of this is general generalities we're speaking in um, and that gets specific to your, your um, system and by region of the country, what the temperature is outside, you know, all the usual uh, factors here. So is that kind of probably a bit longer, but at least it covers a lot of I've seen mistakes made in terms of understanding filtration in this virus. Good, good answer. Thank you. Um, anyone else uh, have something they want to jump in? Yeah, There's I have a question. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Jake. All right. Um, Jake Schneider from Liberty Mutual. So we've had a lot of people trying to push bipolar ionization, UVC on us. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I feel like MERV filters are good enough. Yeah, hi, Jake. Jake and I used to work together at yep. uh, Environmental Health and Engineering. So, um, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a reason I didn't mention those other technologies in my opening comments, right? You know, it's really a time for the basics. Um, you know, ventilation, MERV-13s, portable air cleaners with HEPA. You know, if, if necessary, or if in certain contexts you needed some advanced air cleaning technique, Okay, for example, if you um, maybe were in a you know high volume, um, I mean a lot of people high risk location in a hospital, and you were talking about maybe installing upper room UV. Okay, I could see that. Uh, or if you're in that kind of high risk location and your system can't handle the pressure drop from MERV 13, you really have to clean that air. Okay, induct UV. Great, I could see an application there. I see some schools putting this in, you know, it, it's just, it's a big cost. You need a different level of expertise. You're putting in a radiation source. The maintenance costs are higher. That's a pen, potential hazard. We've seen these used in like VA hospitals and, and there, it adds a lot of concern for the people in the building that there's a radiation source, even if it's totally shielded and protected. So a lot of things you have to think about. And I specifically mentioned UV first because there's more science behind it. You know, we know it works, it can be effective. It's just not the thing I would go to uh, until, you know, unless it was some real challenging scenario that you couldn't be handled from these basics. Um, in terms of bipolar ionization, you know, I, I, I don't, haven't made that as a recommendation anywhere. I've been advising uh, prisons, child care centers, homeless shelters, police departments, uh, arts organizations, major media organizations, finance, biotech, universities, K through 12. I've never recommended that. Uh, one is I think you can get to these to the protection through ventilation filtration through the simple methods we talk about too. If you're adding in ionization, you have to be careful that you're not creating an unintentional respiratory hazard. Many of these generate ozone. Many of them will convert complex VOCs into simple VOCs like formaldehyde, another respiratory irritant. You can generate ultrafine particles, another respiratory hazard. So, Again, you know, I'm not I'm not anti new tech and technology. I evaluate uh, things all day. I used to do this for uh, an investment firm, um, so I like new tech in this space. I just don't I haven't seen it. If, if I saw some tech that I uh, 
thought was the answer, it would have been in my, my slides. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Thanks, Joe. Yeah, no, great, great information. Really appreciate it. And I was just going to ask, um, is it finally a, a, a sense of optimism? I know we'll get through probably the holiday spikes, but with uh, the Moderners and the Pfizer, BioNTech, are we thinking a little more optimistic of the maybe the spring and the summer where we'll see these cases kind of go down and hopefully phase out towards the end of 2021? Just, I guess, what's the, uh, in your opinion, what are your thoughts in the, kind of in the next six months? Yeah, no question, light at the end of the tunnel and no question that we're in the worst part of the pandemic at the same point. Um, <laughs> we're seeing, uh, well, you see what's happening. We're, uh, we just surpassed one daily death uh, toll, 4,000 people. Uh, healthcare system's overwhelmed. There's subtle impacts to the healthcare system. I wouldn't call them subtle, but you know, in, even in places where they've increased ICU capacity, there's been a higher percent of COVID patients, which means other patients are not getting an ICU bed who need it. Many COVID patients are not getting the ICU bed. So the system is overwhelmed. It's at its max. Uh, this is the effects of uh, seasonal forcing. We know coronaviruses uh, circulate higher in the, in the winter seasons. Certainly the effect from the Thanksgiving holiday, then the December holidays through New Year's, we still haven't seen uh, the full effect of Christmas and New Year's yet, right? The lag from cases to uh, hospitalizations and deaths is, you know, on the order of three or four weeks. And you see the daily case counts pushing over 200,000. So I don't think just January is going to be bad. February is going to be bad too. There's no escaping that. Um, so, but the, on the, on the upside, yeah, let's talk about vaccines first because I, and then, and then what's in between, because there's something before vaccines that can really help and should be helping. So the vaccines look terrific. Moderna, Pfizer, you've seen the efficacy in over 95%. Um, the data from AstraZeneca, a little more mixed, but started to be authorized in other, other countries around the world. We expect Johnson & Johnson to have an emergency youth, use authorization for their um, vaccine. So we'll get a report out probably this month on the efficacy there, meaning that we have, should have plenty of supply. Already millions of people are starting to be vaccinated, much slower rollout than we thought. You've seen all the, um, I want to call them hiccups. I just think it's a result of, uh, to be honest, an ineffective administration that had nine months, 10 months to plan for this and totally botched the rollout. So that'll start to get corrected in January and February, hopefully, as we start getting um, more doses to people's arms and, and absolutely will have an effect over the coming months. I'm optimistic about spring and fall. As you start getting 100 million plus people vaccinated, good things will happen. One thing, an area to keep your eye on to, to know how effective it's going to be is keep your eye on Israel right now, where they really were successful with vaccinating the highest risk people over 65 and over 75 year olds. Uh, I think they're over close to 70 percent uh, vaccine already. And so we expect in this week or next to actually start seeing that in the data in terms of cases um, and, and even hospitalizations in older people in Israel. So that'll give you, you know, clearly the dynamics are different in a, in a smaller country like Israel versus the US, but it'll tell you just how quickly when you hit these levels of, um, of vaccination that we can actually see an impact. And of course you start removing higher risk people from the pipeline in the hospital that frees up ICU beds. That means treatment's better for people who are younger, more people who are at their, you know, not at the very end or, or critical care can get into ICUs. So overall benefits everybody and quickly. Other things that are coming that give me hope or keep me optimistic about the fall and spring. Um, you know, we have these rapid tests that are available, not the PCR lab-based tests that are really expensive, can take days to return. Tests that you can either do with saliva or the edge of your nose, gives you an answer in 15 minutes, highly accurate, highly sensitive, highly specific. The current administration, the outgoing administration has not prioritized these. To me, it's like been one of the most baffling parts of the whole response. I don't know how we don't have these. The good news is that the incoming administration and uh, you know, I worked with the uh, uh, incoming CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky and others support the use of these kind of tests. So we're about to see a really different and reinvigorated CDC in just a couple of days here, but the messaging will be a lot more clear. It won't be so ad hoc. I hope to be put out of business myself. I don't think you know, my program should be writing you know, protocols on schools and everything else. It's just, I think science has been filling the gaps, uh, unfortunately. And so the rapid test should come around. So I do think you start to get hundred million people plus vaccinated, rapid tests get rolled out. You know, that, that frees up people to move around a bit more. You can do, um, it can slow the number of cases, but also give some confidence before people 
go on airplanes, you've seen airlines doing this, cruise ships, back to theater, back to office. So I expect that to be part of the strategy. The right now strategy are the non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, mass work. Uh, we have to keep doing that um, for the next, um, you know, I'd say for the, for the coming months. I don't think that's going away anytime soon, uh, probably through the summer. And then only then if we really get a high percentage of people vaccinated, we'll be able to pull off um, or start to pull back from some of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's a long answer, but um, hopefully that's uh, helpful to think about, at least how I think about the right now and then the coming months. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so I think we're getting close to the time limit. Um, Eddie uh, Mulhern, did you have a question? I'm not sure. Joe kind of touched on it, but I was just kind of wondering whether or not we're going to see within the next, you know, coming months, updated guidance from the CDC. Because I can tell you, walking around my campus right now, we still have signs saying one person per elevator. We're doing the cleaning, surface cleaning, paying through the teeth for that. We're, you know, it's, it feels like it's, it's guidance from like June even though the science doesn't really support it anymore, or at least it seems to be moving in a slightly different direction. So I'm just wondering, do you think we're gonna see updated guidelines from the CDC? Because I don't think a campus like mine is gonna be changing until we see that. Yeah, I think we will. Um, and I'm encouraged, I don't know if you saw the, uh, Dr. Walanski had not been in the New York Times yesterday, basically outlining her vision for the CDC. And the first thing she said, she's gonna call it like it is, be totally transparent, devoid of political uh, influence. And it's been quite clear that if you looked at any of the CDC reports over the past year, there's been political uh, meddling. Uh, scientists have been muzzled, uh, the science has been incorrect. And she says the first thing she's gonna do is order her team to do a review of all of the guidance put out to be sure that it reflects current science totally removed from politics. So that's a good sign. You know, whether that'll happen, you know, in January, I don't think so because they have a, they're dealing with a lot. And the single most important thing for all of us uh, is getting the vaccine rollout straightened out. So I, their attention will be everywhere, but I, you know, there are great scientists at the CDC who've just been held back. And I, I think uh, we'll see that turn around. Cause I agree, you know, I could give the guidance all day long that says, what I'm 100% confident in on the risk in elevators, but for organizations to make the change, they need to point to CDC, WHO and say, that's the official guidance, see? Uh, so I get that. So I, I don't know if elevators can be high on their list, but I'm encouraged, you know, they talk about uh, ventilation, I think, but I don't think, I think that guidance is out there and they're just pointing to ASHRAE, which is good. Although I have to say ASHRAE and others have totally failed in, in pulling out, you know, it's some pretty general guidance increased ventilation rates. What does that mean? What, what number, what target? I mean, for, it's like such an academic thing. Sorry, I'll poke on myself. You know, it's like, hey, higher ventilation. Well, what is it? Well, I don't know, we have to study it, but organizations need an answer like right now. What should I be doing? And so I, 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 it's to me, I, I think ASHRAE has failed in that regard, it's so general. Um, and I, I don't, you know, hopefully CDC will come out with an evidence-based number. If not, we're kind of stuck with what guidance, right? You have nothing to point to. Um, other than, you know, reports like from groups like mine and others. Um, so, but I, you know, we're going to see a big change and what nice will be standardized. If you see what's been happening, um, you know, it's all ad hoc state by state, district by district, buildings next to each other are doing different things, but uh, hopefully we'll get some standardization from um, out of CDC, which will be helpful too. We can all point to the same spot and have confidence in it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Janessa and we're kind of, we're at the end of our time. So. Like I'm, I, I don't even facilitate a building. Well, I guess my house, but I could listen to this all day long and I'm sure everyone has still a million questions, but this has been a great way to start our morning. Um, and I want to thank everyone for getting up early to be here and um, having 40 in the room this morning was amazing. So thank you. I do want to do, so thank you so much, Joe. I want to, um, two pieces of information while I have you, please do not leave. Next Friday is the deadline for our call for submissions for both awards and FM Forward 
our conference, you all have at least one thing that you did over the last 24 months that is of interest to someone else within this room. And that's what we're looking for. It doesn't have to be something like unbelievable and so forth. Three questions that you answer and you have three ways of sharing it. And I please, 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 I will be sending out another blast about that today as a reminder and that'll give you all the links and so forth. So please just think about that because you have brilliance to share. And um, I know that from every one of these calls, when everyone shares, I know you're doing great things. Um, and we, what we need to hear that. Also, <clears throat> the think tank, which I noted, this is our thought leaders. A thought leader within IFMA Boston is any FM. We have about um, 350 FMs within the organization. You are our thought leaders, and that's why we ask you for your information. Our think tank is a smaller group of FMs who meet um, on a monthly basis to talk about programming content and so forth for FMs. If you are at all interested, clearly meeting virtually. Um, again, um, John um, Boucher, Pam Fiorelli, um, Andrew Delpre, um, Stephen Chambers, I'm, who are on this call right now um, are on this and Jen Piazza. We would love for you to join us. You can just ping me an email. Um, Joe has left um, the resource in here for um, for the um, what he noted. Um, I will send that. We will. We did record today, um, and that will be as a replay as well, and and so forth. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Thanks awesome. all. Thank Have you. a great Thank rest you. of your day. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.